So I, I would like to welcome you all on the last session. It's interesting, it's last session, it's, uh, there is just the rest of you. And I would say that we have a, maybe the most important topic because it's about human resources and digitalization. Because you heard one and a half day about the, about the digitalization, about the innovations, about everything, but anyway, we are not able to do it without the humans. Thanks God. So this will be ten, the topic and můžu poprosit o prezentaci tu první? Yes. So just for the beginning, I would just get to the topic. So it's human resources and digitalization. And we should consider that uh, in 2023, which means next year, we will be something like 8 billion people on the planet. And true is that we have a fewer and fewer people to really work on the sites and to the technical world. And uh, the, all of the requirements, and you saw this one and a half day, all of these requirements and data and everything are just increasing. And on the chart, on the first one, you have a rising number of the people on the planet. And on the second chart, there are the numbers from the uh, Czech Technical University from Prague. And you can see decreasing number of the graduates. And I know that we are facing this problem all around uh, Europe, that uh, we need technicians, but we don't have them. And digitalization could be one of the answer. As a first, of course, the effectivity, we are able to do much more project with less people. And second, which we would like to mention, is that it can increase the attractiveness of the construction. Because if I even if I talk with my kids, so they are not really interested in construction. It seems to them boring and maybe too difficult. There are much more fancy subjects like chemistry, like biochemistry or medicine. And I think if we want to change uh, our industry and improve it, and it was mentioned here, help to the planet, so we have to change this paradigm. So I, I would like to welcome here our guests. I will start with Bri Brigitta Schock from uh, ETH Zurich. And uh, I will mention that we have a here guest from all of the, let's say, we are covering all life cycle of, the, of any building. Because we have a here architects, we have a here people from FIEC, from contracting business, we have a here uh, representative from IFMA, so it means facility managers. So you will hear about all life cycle of the building. Please, Brigitta. It's yours. Thank you. So first of all, I'd like to thank for the invitation and for addressing this very meaningful topic for all of us. And um, to be honest, this is the better slot we can have after lunch. So um, let's start. If we would be computers and we are here as our avatars, then we could read what is mentioned in here with the zero and the one. But we are not computers, I'm sorry. And therefore, Please stand up, shake a little bit. So lunch is over, the next session will start. And now sit down. <laughs> so my name is Birgitta Schock, as mentioned. Uh, may I dare to say I'm an architect? I do so. I'm here today um, as a program leader of a certification program at the Federal Institute of Technology at ETH Zurich. And that is very challenging. Why is it challenging? Because sometimes when we talk about digitization, when we talk about digital transformation, we start to talk like we did in the last one and a half days, about technology, about formats, about IFC, about XML, and so on and so on. And maybe we talk about BIM collaboration. But honestly, from times to times, we feel like that lost in a labyrinth and don't know where we have to go to. What standards, 
what ISO norms, what regulations should I apply and why should I do so? So I'm here today to inspire you to take the next step and talk about the human needs from a very human-centered perspective when it comes to digitization and digital transformation. So when I was asked to take over this certification program, I was thinking about creating a small ecosystem, a small ecosystem including the perspective from a human way and which is addressing the cultural change and the change and the chance at the same time. So when I talk about digitization and digital transformation, digitization is including, of course, the digital map of existing processes and make assistant information digitality available. But it's more than that. I'm talking about five other topics. And why do I do so? Because it's really important. We all have to take care, and that was addressed in the morning sessions a lot about the responsibility we have for our planet, for our living environment. And therefore, it's very important to understand that in general terms, <laughs> we describe the ongoing process, which is changing our society and our economy, triggered by technology in, let's say, a breakneck speed. And that's the challenge we have, that's the fear of what we have. And therefore, my first challenge was when I started the certification program to face the tiger called digital transformation, digitization. Because if you shipwreck with a tiger, and this is the only one you have on your island, you better get to learn from each other and you better know that you can just survive if you know the needs and the fears, the pains and the gains from each other. So then the fear of this thing called tiger will lose. And if we get awareness that future starts every day new, and we can take small steps, small transition steps, so we may be then ready to make failures and not to blame failures, because that's the best thing. If we talk about experience, that's talking about making failures. The second challenge, and um, yeah, that's what we do. In the first circle of the semester, we go for the going digital in five topics. We address the strategy, we address the human side of the needs. We, of course, talk about technology. We talk a lot about process and how we need to rethink processes. And we talk about organization structure, because normally in companies and organizations, we still have a quite hierarchy strategy, uh, organization structure, which is not very helpful. And that's uh, what we pace in the middle. We build uh, all the program around the foundation program for building smart international, because from us, from our perspective, from the Federal Institute of Technology, it's important to make people understand that if we build building, especially for public clients, we need to work on open BIM standards. That's how we do it. And what works for the one works for almost everyone. So my second challenge is focusing on the people, because people matters. What do I mean with that? Normally, we are trained to do a job, and when we do the job great, we are sent to get some training. And then maybe we do the job better. And what happens then, if we are really good in doing that? We get a promotion. And now the problem starts, because we are not trained to take care of those who are now in charge. We are just trained to do the job we were trained in. So what are we doing? We expect the people who are following us to do the job the same way we did it, because that's what we know. And there is where the problem starts. So to become very successful, we need to get other training. To, we need to get more um, training in helping others to move forward. And that's what we do in the second circle. We just focus on that thing and making people show how it works in very easy sentence, in very easy steps, so everybody can follow. But what is really the trigger in my third challenge, and we talked about this, this is when we do our job great, and if we do it great and also great in the sense of helping the others to do it great, it's still not enough. Because we are not talking about becoming more efficient, we are talking about becoming more generative. Because we have to take care about the planet. 
And working on data can help us. Working with data can even help us more. And if we share the data around the globe, then we can speed up. So this is my three challenges when it comes to this certification program and enlarging the system. We now reaching out for the mindset of the decision makers, because what I learned after the first year having this program at the ATR, well, a good friend mentions one when I started at first, well, if you do a great job, 80% of your students will look for a new job and said, well, are you kidding me? Then I'm not doing a really great job and said, well, you do. I said, well, let's see. And truly, honestly, from these people, 80% have looked for a new job. Why? Because the working environment has not changed. So we need to reach out to the mind makers, to the decision makers, creating other working environment where data-driven working is possible, where addressing new things is possible. So based on that, it's all about putting the piece and pieces together and creating a new comprehensive language with easy explanation and reaching out to each other within the industry. I'm talking about the construction and the real estate and about the people who are taking care about the reuse, but I'm also talking about cross industry because that's the big potential. And if we have to take care about our planet and in one word about us, then we have to leave our silos. And um, I'd like to almost close we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them, Albert Einstein. And that's the last picture. Sometimes it's really helpful if you work in technology and technology-driven working environments, you need to get the overview over what is next. So that is my experience and thank you for letting me present. Okay, thank you very much, Brigitta. And now, now I will ask my colleague Leoš Svoboda to continue, and uh, he's responsible in building Smart Czech Republic for adopting of the certification. And just I would like to ask you one thing, if you can do it for me. If you have a pencil, so there is a one mistake in the program. Because Leoš Svoboda isn't second vice chairman of Building Smart, he was already promoted. So now he's a first vice chairman. <laughs> so, please. Uh, P P Peter forgot to mention that I won the elections, but I was glad to uh, <laughs> give him the chairman place as he does a great job as being the chairman. So you heard me before, I will, basically I will not make the f further introduction as I introduced myself before. I will just go back to my first, uh, first moderation of the session before the lunch. As I started with the survey, right? When I ask you, if I ask five engineers what is BIM, I get seven answers, right? And this is the topic now, okay? This is the topic now, so that we go back from seven, hopefully to five, and eventually to one, yeah? So that people would have the same vocabulary, they would understand the same uh, definitions, at least similar way, all the same way. And that was something, I will go a little bit back, back in the uh, history. We mentioned we started the Building Smart the local chapter in Czech Republic in the spring of 2021. And we had to provide a business plan, marketing plan to show Building Smart how we are going to implement the programs. And we had several subjects uh, implementing the rooms, uh, in getting involved into the standards. Uh, we are part of the standardization committee. And one of them, but they were not in the first place. We had a point to look to look at the certification program because we didn't have enough information. We couldn't imagine what it does mean right, at that time in spring 2021. And over a couple of months, I would say by September, October 2021, we completely changed the business plan because we just put the certification program in the first place and we basically put all the resources and we just have limited resources as we mostly work on the volunteer basis. So we put all the resources we could on the uh, on impl implementation of the certification program because we wanted to get this same understanding to really get people on the same 
on the same level in understanding what are the basics of open BIM, what are the basics of uh, the key standards driving the digitization and key standards, I mean ISO 19650 from the process point of view. And we found that this program, which is called certification, but it's mostly training because it provides the organized training to people and then they can certify, but it provides them with the knowledge, which is the same. And what is important, it's not only the same for our market, for <laughs> our 10 million people in our country, but it's the same worldwide, because it has been implemented by Building Smart International in about 20 countries. And I will get to that a little later. So we thought, well, this is a global world. This is really international business. When I look uh, 40 years back, you didn't need to know any other language if you were in construction. There were just construct Czech construction and Slovak, right? We used to be Czechoslovakia, but we understand and underst still understand each other. But the, there, let's say with the exception of like building the nuclear power plant, right? There was international cooperation, uh, but you didn't need English for that. But at this time, we are small markets, so we are export uh, depending economy. So we need to export. And in the same time, we have a lot of uh, international companies here. I would say Vinci, I would say Strabag, I would say Hochtief, Skanska, and so on. So our construction uh, employees, managers, get in close touch with the international companies. They work in international teams, also on digitization, also on BIM. So it helps to have one single understanding of the basics of BIM, and that's why we selected. And I will take you briefly through. As Birgitta had all the pieces in her last slides, I'm going to that one piece now, yeah? But I will just give you a little, in my time, a little overview. The goal is to really improve the understanding skills of the professionals. I'm not talking about students, uh, I'm talking about the whole life, uh, how you call it, continuing education here. And uh, one of the principles is Building Smart does not provide a training. We don't train the people. We uh, help uh, companies, we help SMEs. Basically, this is big help from Building Smart because we give SMEs the chance to train, we generate their business. So this is big help for SMEs who are consulting companies who want to train people in the construction industry. And it's standardized worldwide. It's the same content, well, with one exception. It's, it's all around the standards, including the Open BIM standards, but also a lot of ISO standards or SEN or IEC in some cases. And uh, it has basically two, two levels. One is the foundation level, which is more for knowledge-based learning, so you get uh, understanding and there is the practitioner level, which is more on, on the practical side, so that you need to prove that you have the practice to be able to get that level uh, of training and certification. In other picture, you have the foundation basic course is the basis we implemented, and then Building Smart Prepares and currently implements the practitioner, uh, practitioner level. So if you look at the big picture, we have ov overall Building Smart has about 11,000 uh, qualified Try, uh, certified individuals worldwide already. As far as, sound, as, as I know, only in Germany and Austria, there are over 5,000 engineers certified. And there are a bunch of uh, certified professionals in China, for example, and in other countries. You see the countries uh, who already run the program, and we are glad we are part of those uh, 15 in operations. And there are eight other chapters, eight other countries, and you see them there, including our neighbors, Poland or Slovenia, Croatia, and also you know the first uh, African member of Building Smart, which is Morocco. They are quite active and moving ahead, also with the certification. And on the right side, and I don't have the laser pointer, or I, I, well, it doesn't matter. On the right side, you see there are over 140 training providers. They are independent companies. They are not part of part of Building Smart. We just give them the tools and we qualify them and approve their training content. And based on that, they are completely independent and they train the, the individuals, <clears throat> the frequentants, the students. And just briefly, the content is, as I said, standardized. There is a full list of learning outcomes, a comprehensive material body of knowledge which summarizes what is the basics, what the students should learn and what should be able to show in the tests. With the, so there's one standard question database, which is localized 
all this stuff is localized. So as we did the implementation in our country, we translated the learning outcomes, we translated the body of knowledge, and we translated the question database, well, including what are the right, right answers, right? So, <laughs> but we, uh, all of that was localized to the Czech language, and this is what the other countries do. As far as I was looking at the, at the web pages, there are about eight or nine languages uh, available where you can select, uh, select the. By the way, Celine is in charge of the whole thing, right? So Celine would correct me if I'm wrong, yeah? Please, yeah? So th this is the content which we localized, and uh, uh, these are the basic learning outcomes. These are like the titles, and each of them have subtitles. So it includes the BIM, Open BIM, processes, standards, and processes with the organization, how to implement BIM in standard way, the organizational change. And there's that module six, which could be localized by any country. We decided not to do it at this time because we still have the national dis discussion going how we implement, uh, implement the national implementation strategy with the government. We work closely with the government, but until at that's resolved, we will not make this module after it's resolved and we have clear way how the BIM strategy would be uh, considered. We would include the module number six. And there are some, you know, the basic basic uh, web pages where you can go. Anyone can go there. Anyone can register. But of course, there's the process how you apply to get trained, how you then get apply to get uh, certified. The certificates are standard, the same thing worldwide. So if you if you get certified in Japan or or US or Morocco soon, you get the same certificate. And if you are Moroccan, and I don't know if there's anyone from Morocco, but if you are Moroccan, and then you get a job in Japan, you just get your certificate and you are on the same level of the BIM knowledge. So this is what is the description. There are five steps in the process, and these are the standards documents which are available only some of them only on the NDA basis for companies who really want to become training providers so that they get some of the content. It's not all of that is publicly available. So we are just in, in July, I believe, in July this year, and we were very fast. We, it took us about seven or eight months to uh, localize the whole thing. So in, in July, we introduced that this is available in Czech. So this is why it is in Czech, and you cannot read it, but it says it's available in Czech. And uh, already we are part of the international register. So we have our registered training providers listed on the international building smart pages, and we have the, our certified individuals listed. Some of them are here. I call Ivo, and Ivo is uh, not sleeping yet, but Ivo is one of the, Kohoshek uh, is one of the, uh, and uh, there were other guys here, but I cannot see them now. So we have five, we have five certified training providers including the university, which is the Technical University in Ostrava. We had presentation in the morning from a member of Technical University, Mr. Konechny. And uh, so we have not just commercial companies providing the training, but we have also university who would be one of the training providers. We have other seven or eight companies signed to become training provider soon. So this is our result and brief overview of the a certification program from Building Smart, and here, here are the links if you would be interested to learn more. And that's for me. Thank you. So thank you, Leos. And now I will ask Philip Crimpton, the president of FIEC, and after the architect and then consultant will tell us something, someone from the construction business. Uh, thank you very, very much. First of all, thank you for inviting me here uh, this afternoon. Uh, after a few comments from the previous panel, I think as president of FIAC, I should explain exactly what FIAC is and what it means. Uh, we are the European Construction Industry Federation, and we represent construction companies of all sizes, from one person craftsmen, SMEs to the very large contracting firms. From building and civil engineering specialities engage in all kinds of working methods. And thanks to this wide-ranging representation, FIAC is the officially recognized social partner representing employers in the European sectoral social dialogue. 
So when contractors were asked to put their hands up earlier, I could only put my hand up once, not 200,000 times. But I've been asked to talk to you all today about digitalization as a means for improving the image and the working conditions of the construction sector. And as a contractor, I will stick to the point. I am going to give you four messages today and hopefully deliver them as simply as I can. Firstly, digitalization can make the construction sector more attractive for young people. Digitalization is both a challenge and an opportunity for training purposes. Digitalization can help improve health and safety on construction sites, and digitalization can help to enforce labor law. You won't have heard anything about this in this conference so far. So how do we make the construction industry more attractive for young people? The construction sector tends to have a negative perception amongst the youngest of our society. These young people are mostly attracted to high growth industries that are on the cutting edge of technology. Working in construction is often considered as the second best option. Construction is considered to be physically demanding, unsafe, dirty, and as such, this stereotypical image of the sector needs to be challenged and the industry needs to be made more appealing. Now, digitalization offers this possibility, the possibility of working with new cutting edge tools, be they computers, 3D printers, robots, drones. You saw robots here yesterday with my colleague Joel Sean, also from FIAC. This provides new solutions and reduces manual process and on-site activity, all adding to the efficiency of our sector. In addition, rather than leading to job destruction, digitalization will also create trades that none of us have even heard of yet and don't even exist. These trades will be more appealing to a younger workforce. Maybe we'll end up with robotic arm operators, BIM modelers, the possibilities are absolutely endless. Embracing these new support possibilities that digitalization offers will surely make a real difference to recruiting younger generations to our industry. So digitalization is both a challenge and an opportunity for training purposes. One of the major challenges that construction companies are facing is the lack of workers with the right skills. There is therefore a need to ensure that training schemes do adequately take into account technical development, in particular the field of digitalization. In this respect, FIAC is participating in the framework of the Construction Blueprint Project. The goal of this project is to anticipate the skills needs and the fields of digitalization, energy efficiency and the circular economy and to influence the contact and curricula of these training schemes to ensure that they're fit for purpose. We are also a signatory to the Pact for Skills in Construction and the aim here is to mobilize all relevant stakeholders in order to upskill and more importantly reskill the workforce. In addition to providing opportunities for new and more attractive jobs, digitalization can also provide for new and safer ways of learning. This could include, for example, the use of simulators for cranes. So crane operators, when they're training, can use a simulator. Those don't exist at the moment, as far as I know. And offer construction and other construction machines, thereby making training on-site safer. Health and safety is important, and I think digitalization can help improve health and safety on our construction sites. Simply by using BIM from the design phase of the process, we can anticipate many possible shortcomings. We can better coordinate, better inform, better prepare our workers up front. 
BIM also enables better preparation of the construction site and its surroundings, as well as better coordination of their respective interfaces. All of this makes the construction site a safer place today than it was 10 years ago. Another example is and will be the use of robotics. Robotics will be used to paint ceilings and walls. Robotics will intervene in highly dusty areas, therefore avoiding the exposure of the worker to such dust. Yes, it might be aspirational right now, but I see us heading that way. All of these technologies will help us to address mucoskeleton disorders and respiratory disorders in the future, which still unfortunately plague a lot of our workforce. I spoke about attracting younger people to construction. All this will be useless if we're not able to retain them in the industry for as long as we can. It's our responsibility to continue improving working conditions and digitalization will be an important tool in achieving this. Digitalization can and will be used and is being used to help enforce labor law. Now this is nothing to do with BIM or construction, it's just to do with pure technology. Unfortunately, and we can't condone this, fraudulent practices are still present in the construction industry and we have to admit that. However, in many countries, the sectoral societal par partners have developed their own, often digital, structure to address these kinds of problems. An example of this is what we call social ID cards. They're developed according to national circumstances and needs. They can be used to cover many aspects and are structured in many different ways. They can provide access to information about the employer. For example, is the company registered? Has it paid all its social security cons contributions? And have all the hours been noted properly? They can also provide access to information about workers. Who is her real, his or her real employer? What are their qualifications? Thereby providing transparency and helping with the enforcement of rules and regulations. All this can help ensure that compliant companies are not put at competitive disadvantage. This is actually so important to us that we'd submitted a joint project together with our EU sectoral trade union partner, the FBWW. We're waiting for the green light from the European Commission to get this project started. Our joint aim is to complete an exhaustive mapping of existing schemes in the sector and then undertake a feasibility study regarding the interconnection of these schemes. So to summarize, FIAC welcomes the ongoing digitalization of our industry. Digitalization can make the construction sector more attractive for young people. Digitalization is both a challenge and opportunity for training purposes. Digitalization can help improve self and waif health and safety on our sites. And digitalization can help enforce labor law. All of this, I think, will help to improve the image and the working conditions of our industry. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Philip. And now I would like to ask uh, Josh Deschamp from IFMA, because facility management is the longest period of life cycle of the building. And I have uh, all the time a lot of questions from a colleague from Czech IFMA. They had ISIM conference two days ago about the BIM and about the qualification and how should be facility management teach on the university or if should be teach. So please tell us something about Okay, it. if you don't mind, I will walk around because I perform better when I move. So, um, <clears throat> so I'm Jos. So um, I will have first slides about our association. So what we do and how we try to achieve the goals. And then I will talk about uh, 
this topic, uh, what is uh, announced uh, in the program, human resources versus digitization. So IFMA is the International Facilities Management Association, so it exists for more than 40 years. It's all across the, across the globe. And you see, actually, the most important thing is that the mission. So we advance their collective knowledge, value, and growth for facility management professionals to perform at the highest level. So our members are individuals. So we want to increase their profession, their knowledge about facility management to perform better. And we do it, and that's in the vision, in the built environment to make the world a better place. So the built environment, these are the physical assets. And to make the world a better place, it's connected to the human beings. So from our profession, we're very connected to how people behave and how they work, how they live into, uh, <clears throat> into the work environment. So how we can help our, our members is on three levels. So we try, so if a member uh, or is a person, a facility manager becomes a member of IFMA, he can learn, he can connect and he can advance. So he can learn, it's about the training program and it's similar to what you have presented a couple of minutes ago. This person can connect towards the chapters. Eh? If we have uh, 11 chapters in Europe, um, we have about 234 countries we have members, so it's about more than 200 different chapters. So into councils, into communities, into events we organize, so people can share knowledge and exchange ideas. And the third one is advanced because of the, um, the research we have, so we have our own research center in, uh, in IFMA. So we try to develop new things, we work together with other associations, uh, we work together with universities, uh, with other research centers. So, and actually the, the training of IFMA or the facility management profession is based on 11 competences. And you can see in the middle that facility management and technology management is, con uh, is connected. Facility information management. So if we talk about BIM, I think we should talk much more about information management. BIM is one component of this. Uh, and so this is also what IFMA stands for. So we try to increase um, the, the competence of our members in facilities information management. And one right to this is a competency and human factors. So both of these topics, I think, in the competences from our associations are very connected to what we've been discussing this um, yesterday and today. And so, as I said before, it's, it's, we do training. So IFMA is providing training on an international level. And it, it ends up in, in different credential programs so that the program is actually um, it's international. So if you become a certified facilities management professional or um, a sustainable facility professional, this is, you, can, you can use it all over the globe. So it's an international recognized uh, program that, um, that you can do online or in person. So there are several topics that are related there. <clears throat> when I look, so the second part, when I look into the title of this uh, uh, session, I was not convinced that this is the right one. It's not about human versus digitization, but it should be digitization that embraces actually human resources or vice versa. And so I give you three arguments now why I think that is important. And actually, Frank, you give in the final session, uh, uh, your final closing, you give already the introduction of this speech. So we talk about the total life cycle and cost of a building. And so 70% of the total life cycle cost is spent by the facilities managers. Digitization can support the collaboration between the parties who are in charge of the left-hand side, so the design and build, and who are in charge of the facilities management. So it's, it's the, although we hate architects, sometimes we like them, but digitization could, could help us in collaborating much more together, so that, that actually they're, in, they're able to design buildings that we can operate and we can manage. So the second component, ah, do you know this person? This is Julia. You know Julia? Everybody knows Julia. You see a lot of Julias if you go to the underground after this session on the platform. Julia has a problem. Her smartphone is connected to her hand. She cannot get rid of it anymore. She's looking into every day, every minute. So she's so much connected to technology so that she cannot live without her without it. But should digitization support her well-being? 
So this is actually what we should talk about. And this is what facilities management try to do, to support well-being by using digitization. Do you know this person? Yes, you know him. That's Maurice. He's from France. No, he is the concierge of my secondary school 40 years ago. And actually, Maurice, he lived in the school. He was the facility manager avant la lettre. And he was actually managing the entire school without any digital tools. But his eyes were his ticketing system. In his head, he has his preventive maintenance plan. And he was doing well. He was able to manage the entire school. Of course, you know this person. It's Peter. He's suffering from homework. Actually, Peter has to work from home because there is a new homework policy in his office. He needs to work from home two days in a week. But actually, Peter wants to go out and he wants to go and to work in different types of buildings, in corporate office, but also in the home office, but also in co-working spaces. So digitization can help Peter to increase his well-being and also to increase his profitability. So tools exist today. This is an example of a tool that calls Facil that actually supports the human experience. So the employee experience during the entire day of, uh, of the building. So new tools are helping to support people in the organization. And the third component, it's about added value. So we can talk about technology, but what are we doing it for? So added value for the organization. So increased technology in the companies. So the example of Facil managing hybrid working try to actually optimize the connection between the needs of the employees and the teams and how we provide the working environment. It's managed by this tool. It's managed by Facil. So the added value for the organization is this. So before COVID, 75% of the building was used. After COVID, it was only on Tuesday and Thursday, it was 70%. But with Facil, we're able to reduce the space that needs to be provided by the company, but the 55% is used for 100% because we spread the peak of the occupation in the buildings through the entire, uh, through the entire week. So this is an added value for the, for the organization. The added value for the team with this tool is that they can collaborate together because they're able with this tool to manage the team meetings, to manage their team days, actually to make a reservation of space or, or workstations. So again, this app is supporting not only the organization, the teams, but also working for Peter, who has now a workstation in the office, because able to make a reservation of this space on this day, on this spot, he can work. So it's not about human resource versus digitization, but I think both of them, they should embrace each other for the benefit of the organization, for the teams, and for the individual. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Joe. So thank you, George. And on the end, on the last speaker, I will ask Kalesh Marek from Faculty of Architecture. Please, it's your turn. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy that you are still here. You must be a real BIM fans. Yes, stay still with us. So I try to be short and not to be so much boring. Uh, my name is Aleš Marek. I'm from the Faculty of Architecture here in Prague. And I would like to talk about uh, human resource versus digitalization. And I wanted to, uh, to translate it to myself, yes, because I want to be personal in my presentation about what I can talk about, what I can talk about, of course. I'm doing the design, and we call it in the uh, current days, integrated design all the time. And since the very beginning of my practice, it unfortunately started 32 years maybe more ago, we are using computers. And the question is the same, was the, the, what is the efficient usage of computers? And I would like a little bit to touch or to step out uh, our mental ghetto of BIM. 
because we are not a little bit captured by the topic of the BIM. We are still talking about the keywords, about the uh, same thing. It is a repetition, but we are losing a little bit of sense why we are doing it. And, and I would like to, because the topic is the, it's decreasing, it is your, I was surprised by the continuing time. I have more than two minutes, so, so. okay, no problem. So I will, uh, so I will, well, it's a bit, how sometimes I don't know who told, it was a bluesman, he told, go back to the roots. So I would like to repeat and go a little bit to the roots and to add an additional layer of the basic information about the office, about the BIM. But what I started to run briefly with you through what we are doing regarding the BIM and computer education here in Prague at the faculty. So study programs, we have a bachelor's, master's study program, and of course, doctor's study program. In the bachelor's program, we are uh, teaching the students the grammar of the, the CAD and BIM. It is the learning to use the basic software, which is Revit and Archicad. And as a final product of their bachelor's study, they are, some of them are doing their bachelor project in BIM. Uh, including some kind of sharing via CDE, and in the final they are not getting the mark regarding the quality, the professional quality of the bachelor's project, but as well we set up a committee and evaluated their project regarding the quality of the BIM, because we are giving them the data standards for the for this project, it is the combination, something between the building permit design stage and execution or realization project design stage. Uh, in master study program, uh, I will show you what uh, our syllabus for this. We have some, it, it's a little bit BIM tasting, it is like wine tasting because it is the one semester BIM course. Uh, called, it is the uh, part of the module which is the computer design. I will show you later and we are, to, it is split half by half by the lectures and practices. In the lectures, we are showing them the samples, how they uh, can use the, uh, the BIM models for the bill of quantities, uh, visualization, of course, it is mean the daylight studies and some expert studies, etc. the snag, uh, not the snag list, but the clash, de clash detection and so on. And uh, another section of our education is lifelong learning, which we count much more important because the, uh, the necessity of learning never stops in our profession. So we have uh, two courses set up already. It is for the uh, beginners and the advanced ones regarding the BIM. Uh, next one, next line is Eurotech. It is the cooperation of six European uh, universities regarding the uh, regarding the engineering education, and it is two products which is running now. Is first one is the such called as the course catalog. It is the sharing via these universities the lectures which is going in the semester at all universities, and it is almost attended by uh, uh, MS Teams or Zoom or whatever. And the second, which is much more uh, popular now because we have an increase of students there, it is so-called Collider. It is a project-oriented uh, project where the teams set up by, from the uh, students of different universities assembly. And uh, they are, it is a blended version, so-called it is the mix of the uh, DJ connections and uh, personal face-to-face -face meeting. Of course, the next line is the Czech Chamber of Architects. We are trying to start up the coordination regarding the architects' education in BIM here in Czech Republic. And of course, we need to cooperate with uh, Czech Standardization Agency, uh, Agency and uh, Ministry of Social Affairs or whatever. And we are talking about the competencies. So now you see what I talk about. It is the subjects of computer design module. BIM, architecture and geometry. Another one, what you can read, it is what I talked, it is the uh, design uh, computing BIM syllabus. The red ones are lectures and the green ones are practices, so it is half and half. And we pu push the students to present their works because they are happy to present uh, the work in the final week. We have a, a certain week semester. 
and we are giving a chance to discuss it with other participants of the course of the lectures and with us and i think it is popular and uh, we've got as well a good feedback from the students in this last discussion or presentation uh, this is the numbers, yes. Uh, the pilot project was uh, 1920, and the first year we ran uh, this uh, design computing subject with uh, 45 students in total. It is a mix of students because there are Czech ones, normal study program, uh, master degree, and as well it is, there are Erasmus students and uh, self-paying -pay students. So we decided to learn it only in English, or better to say in Czech English, but I think it is, we are pretty happy. We are improving our English and the English of Czech students as well. And the number is increasing. In second line, there is a total number in a master's degree was 363 students. 12% uh, uh, of them attended this course because it is not mandatory one. But uh, it was increasing this year's about half, 50, 42%. And what is it all about? I will try to show you, let's say, our design philosophy. And uh, I think it will be, I hope, it will be a little bit refreshing, yes, to talk about the basic or why we are doing. Because I think what is still missing or, or it must be still uh, repeating is the briefly explanation what is BIM and second point is briefly explanation why we are doing it what is the benefits because sometimes the people which are out of our uh, ecosystem is a little bit lost in this new speak of the BIM so and of course uh, everything happened at our in our world so I think we can use what was said by Vitruvius uh, 100 years before Christ, firmitas utritas venustas. And what was said uh, almost one and 150 years later. So our explanation by Buckminster and Fuller, it is regarding the integrity, you can read it. And my translation about vitruvios, vermitas, utilitas, vetustas, that we has to combine in positive compromise, I call it, architecture design, technical design, including structure design, tech, technical design, mechanical engineering, etc. But what is very popular, and Vitruvio said it 2,000 years ago, take into the account the lifelong cycle of the project. And the second point is the digitalization design process. So since 88 we use CATS, since 2010 we call it as, as a BIM. And it is a little bit brought us that we can use it is as to uh, be sure with our assumption regarding the design to uh, verify by uh, expert assessment dynamic simulation. So I'm looking a bit out of the time, but I hope you can stay still here. Uh, what is new in our work and as well in our method? So I think prior to BIM, that first step, and of course it is combined that we design the buildings, I call it architectural design, after that to present our, the results of our work, we draw, make a drawings, it was a so-called project documentation, but what is inserted now, it is the step number two, by my understanding, it's a creation of a BIM model. And I'm talking about it because, of course, these three steps are going together. But I think the, how it is set up, that the creation of BIM model, let's say the result of the mental thinking, mental design, it must be prior to project documentation. In the 10, 15, 12 years ago, we did it parallel or oppositely, and it is a waste of time. It is not systematic. So we have to be take care of that. Uh, it is what is the second stand, it is our understanding in our office, how we call it, it is the digital uh, or information model, the green bubble is a digital, uh, the digital model, it is which is uh, modeled, and the blue one, it is what is added by another software, by IFC or whatever, 
and which is run under the processes. Because the processes is very important as well, and so we try to understand, uh, so I try to present to our students to understand the main or the basic processes through the lifelong cycle. It is important for their better design. Next one, and it is some scheme which I found on the web where we are targeting, today we call it high performance building, and it is the assemble of, let's say, the different positions, uh, demands on the buildings. Similarity of BIM and integrated design, yes, I think Mr. McLean may, uh, may this curve, yes, and we think it is useful for both integrated design of BIM, because it's a little bit pushing at least to think about the work, about the design in advance. Yes, and I think in this case BIM uh, approach to the design works yes, support this integration design, which brings us to the sustainable design through the entire lifelong cycle. And it is, a, we made some of the data survey in our company. It was, uh, we made a 28 percent, a 28 project since, or between 2010 and 2020 in a hard beam. So we used a CD and of course made the all sub models in, in beam. And we found out that in the design stage building permit, we need, if we are doing the beam model, more than 7% time allowance, and in execution phase it is roughly 3% model. So it is supporting the curves that it is a little bit pushing the request for information because in the final uh, stage of the construction it little bit was shortened. Now it is where we are heading, it is description of Europe uh, uh, regarding the BIM and so called future competence, so it is the competencies, left uh, column is the future competencies according to Eurotech, five, uh, the, the right one is the graduation, uh, is the profile of graduate, I think the split is pretty good and as well it is running on a lot of platforms. <laughs> And as well, I would like to back to the history because I think uh, one of the best times of our country was Baroque era. It was represented by architect uh, Klian Ignaz Diesenhofer. And what I like is he turned, uh, he learned the um, business, the construction business from his father. After that time, he shortly studied uh, philosophy and mathematics at the university. After that, when he went abroad, and as well, he was present at the uh, construction process on the site. And I think we can find everything what is substantial for the, the education uh, of the contemporary architect. And I think what I can add or to stress on, that is a vision. It is the part of the philosophy, and I use a chance that Vinnie Maas uh, uh, is uh, uh, running the, as a visiting professor this semester the uh, course. It is called BioWorld. And it is not just practicing architect, but it is running as a the Y factory, the think tank, when arising, still arising the questions regarding the future. Strategy on the top is what, what, uh, what we think it is important. I would like to stress on the fact that my understanding of the good teacher, he must, ha he must uh, have three legs, private practice, not to be funny because the uh, best practice is still developing research and as well the lecture training. So to have a good picture, uh, to have a good lecture or teacher, he must have uh, these experiences. And what will be the profile of graduate? I don't know, please help us. Thanks for be patient and sorry for be too long. Okay, thank you, Alex. And now we have a few minutes to answer some questions. So if you will have any question, please ask them now directly or through the application. And, uh, and is there any, maybe at the first I will ask something by myself. And because uh, in 2015, when we wrote down the conception in BIM in Czech Republic, I truly I thought that in 2020 we will be much more developed, and that the community of BIM fun will be much bigger. But truly, 
I see on all of these conferences, now I will say from the Czech side, nearly the same faces, all of the six years. And really, I have had that feeling that there is growing the gap between these BIM fans and the rest of the world. <laughs> And I can see it on the sides, I can see it in Chamber of the Architects on, or on the other places. And my question would be on each of you. So does your students or employees, does they like BIM or they are afraid of it? Please, Leoš, if you can start. Well, I'm not teaching directly, so I will more address how our training providers see it. And I believe on that side, uh, they are not students, they are uh, experts in the field already. So they definitely, they definitely like the like BIM. That's, uh, but it's a different, uh, different group of people who go for the uh, professional certification and training because they can see a clear benefit to uh, have improving their career and uh, getting better job opportunities with having that uh, achieving that certified level. So that's not the. Uh, the overall experience with uh, students uh, who are just uh, in this, uh, architecture or civil engineering studies. So I hope uh, Brigitta would uh, would follow up with more uh, more general purview of that. So I'm, I'm quite sorry, but I'm not engaged in the bachelor and the master. But my students are uh, in the continuous education. However, what I see um, coming to your question, whether they like BIM. After this one year, they got so many more perspectives what BIM is about and what they can do with it. Because looking from the different perspective, my students come, for example, from the architects, civil engineers, machine engineers, electric engineers, uh, HVAC, facades, and everything. So what they learn through that course, yes, BIM is something you can ask for. But what you can do, what you can create for value, that's what they really like. And sometimes that's the, the missing point in the education, that it's not clear what building information, hmm, management, modeling, whatever stands for. So the whole value, it's not quite clear. Do, do we ask our children if they are six or seven, eight years old, do you, lo do you like mathematics? when they go to primary school? No. But it's part of the program. So from my perspective, I'm, I'm, I'm not a teacher. And you, during lunch, you say, we need to introduce it in kindergarten. So it's a no-brainer. So we should integrate these classes related to BIM in all programs. It's horizontal, it's transversal over a lot of training programs that you have and it's on university professional university it's in programs that we ifma does that that uh, building smart is doing or, or connected to other associations that do training for people who are already experts it should be part of all training programs in the future definitely i just don't agree i think that the kids in the first class they like mathematics and the, really they are looking forward to go to this i've got four kids so i know <laughs> so they are really looking forward to go there and then they hit the wall sometimes with the wrong teacher and the wrong system of the teaching and that it changed and they end up on technical university <laughs> and they are disappointed no, i'm joking now <laughs> so philip if you Obviously, I'm not a teacher, but I am a contractor. And so the question, I'll, I'll answer a slightly different question. Do I like BIM? And I'll answer that with a story. Uh, in the l late 1980s, we were building the International Financial Services Centre in Dublin. And the architect had just, literally just, installed auto, an AutoCAD type product in his office. And he came to me and he said, Philip, this is fantastic. And I said, Martin, what's so fantastic about this? He says, I can draw this tile layout on my computer and I would never have been able to draw it by hand. And I said to him, well, Martin, if you can't draw it by hand, how can you expect my tradesman to build it by hand? So now we move on. We move on to this year where I've just completed 
a small residential project in Portugal. BIM was used throughout the project, from the architect to the small builder to the subcontractors. A very complicated stone layout. No problem. All the information went straight from architect to contractor to stone contractor to stone cutter. And computerized machines cut the stones exactly the way the architect wanted. We couldn't do that in the late 1980s. We arrived on site, not a single piece of waste on site because everything was cut perfectly to size. The end of this five or six million, not a big project, it was five or six million euro residential project, I had a snag list of one page. Ask me, do I like BIM? I love it. Yeah. You see, it's fuller room of the BIM fans, so. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, what, what you mentioned, it reminds me but that maybe one of the help and maybe something what we should do in building smart is really to, I know that in Switzerland you have a system of use case management and this would really help and I can see it to the middle size and smaller companies to really see how they can use practically BIM. Because on all of these conferences uh, we are somewhere on the cloud. <laughs> and they need practical cases. Yeah. And I'd like to add just one point. Yes, we do have the use case management. Is it on? Yeah, yeah, now it's on. Um, but it's part of the Building Smart International community, so everybody in the room can just use it and put their use case on it. And on the other thing uh, side, we have in Switzerland the society of the contractors and they are now currently working on a guide to digital transformation for contractors for building companies and i think this is once again one good thing which we like to adopt at least from our chapter and from the austrian chapter to to take this guide to digital transformation because it's a guide which uh, which you have several questions around and if you can just use this everywhere in all countries then we can see where the differences are where we can put the resources in and where, where we can create valuable and meaningful education mm -hmm. yeah uh, philip you wanted to say something. yeah i just want, wanted to add and, and that, that is important but another thing we have to look at and some people say well, you know, why aren't contractors getting involved many aren't because by and large, contractors are the last people to get involved in a project. If you look at the traditional procure way of procuring a project, a, a, a client decides he wants to build something, he hires, hires a design team, design, he gets the design approved by the client, and then they put the job out to 28 tenderers to go, and whoever's the lowest, most stupid bid gets the project. That's a recipe for disaster, and has been, has been forever. However, when I use on my development side of my business, when I'm working, I take early contractor involvement I find is important. And as an industry, as a contractor, I've always wanted to be involved early with my client and try to negotiate a contract rather than go through the hard bid process. Then you can use all these tools and get your models in as quickly as possible. So, but we have to, but public procurement, that's more difficult, unless it's a design build process. And not all small and medium small companies have the cash resources to put into a design bill bid, which is a very, very expensive thing. So I think it's horses for courses. But rest assured, the industry, the, the construction industry, is getting behind BIM. Mightn't be as fast as all you guys want, but we are getting there because we see the benefits of it. But once, you, once contractors see the benefit, they, they, are, they get hooked, hooked very quickly. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and there is some question to Alesh, if you can. Maybe, uh, sorry for, I will respond it later on, but I think if I remember well, the, your question in principle was fear of BIM or something like that. And I think it is very important because this question we are facing in every level all the day. And I try to explain with, I think, and I remember the start of CAD in the late 80s, last century, there were the still same questions, what is it computer for, we will draft it, uh, we will draft it much more faster in the hand and blah, blah, blah. Now, nobody, everyone is drawing by computer, even if it is necessary to make a sketch, it is a way of thinking in design architecture, including. 
And the same question is why we need a BAM. And uh, my response is, 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 is simple, yes, if it will be used reasonably and efficiently. So it will, uh, it, will be the, it will be profitable and will bring benefits. Otherwise, it is nonsense to push. And I think there are certain levels and try to explain. First is the way of thinking. And I think it is a way of thinking of everyone who is involved. And I, uh, in my presentation, I remember uh, Klean Ignaz Diesenhofer because he studied mathematics. And mathematics is not about just the figures, just the forms, but it is the way of thinking, analysis, and so on, and I'm preparing you to be organized, standardized, uh, automatization, automatization, and of course such weird words. Yes, it, it is some brainstorming and brain preparation for your future work, and of course to be captured just in these figures. And in the materiality, it, I think it is necessary to study as a philosophy, to have a still visions, try to combine that, yes? And if the kind of the basic education will be good, and it is much more going with the secondary school than with the universities, yes? To be prepared mentally for the studies. And we have a different, or I have a different experience, the practice ones. The young designers are same as the Julia was presented, yes? They are connected or welded to their computers, and no one, uh, no, no one can make the uh, drawings by hand. The old generation is a little bit bored by the uh, construction business itself, but about the bureaucracy which is going with the BIM, yes? It is not, and it is, uh, it, it's a rumor, yes, it is uh, faster and cheaper. Now, in this level of bureaucracy, which is starting to do in everyday life is the project of BIM, it is increasing of time, increasing of money, because you resolve so much parallel uh, aspects and issues. So it is the bureaucracy and to not organize uh, environment regarding the BIM, because there are no rules. In the architectural universities, it is students, the same as Julia, and we need to push them to make a handmade sketches, which can be readable. But the teachers are afraid that the students will be captured by the possibilities of computer design and will stop the, their, uh, how it is called, they won't be able to make a good design. Yes, they will be just will left it uh, to the computers. Yes, that's the scares of the BIM future. So I try to explain that it's not so easy question, but it is very important. Try to stop the fear of BIM. Maybe we can continue with that first question, which is there, or last one. Should BIM be only additional skill or and not primary profession? I think if I can say as a first, I think both. We, we need professionals in BIM as a BIM coordinators and others for them, it will be the main profession, but I think we need that uh, each, each participant on the site or on the design process will know what is it. So what do you think? Well, uh, I think BIM is, is a part of, it's, for me it's really a part of, and um, the question for me tends more toward uh, what do we need for a high-performance building or for a high-performance environment? And therefore, we are talking uh, from the perspective of being of a part of maybe an integrated understanding of a delivery. So I think having the, the baseline BIM understanding um, additionally as a skill, fine, but that's not enough. And having just it as a primary, uh, primary profession, it's not enough. It has to be all of them. I agree. And please, Josh, there is a question on you. That's too difficult for me. Uh, which countries from your experience? No, there is, no, I see the question, which countries, but there is no research done on this. So it's, um, and actually talking about BIM for facility managers, um, I've been talking with a lot of people during the last two days and um, if you go to facility managers today and you ask, do you see added value in using BIM today in managing your existing facilities? I don't think we will have positive answers because in existing buildings, it's still very difficult to present the added value of BIM for facilities management. 
if you built a new building where actually the facility manager could be involved, eh? for example, in DBFM projects, where facility manager could be involved in the early stage of the project, and where actually the entire project is managed by using BIM, then there is really an added value. And it's, it's actually because of the facility manager will be in charge of getting the data, getting the information when there is the handover of the building. And actually he should be able to, 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 um, to define the requirements of what he or she needs when managing the building early in the project. And BIM can support this process. But to give an answer to the question, it's, it's very hard. Uh, we've been involved in the Netherlands and Belgium in projects in trying to connect the, the model when the building was finished into uh, an IWMS, so an integrated workplace management system. So somebody was mentioning the uh, computer-aided facility management. That's old school. It's not computer-aided. It should be computer-integrated. So CIFM or IWMS or, or new things that are, so we need to have this integration. But I think it's, it, this process is starting. And so in, in, in the Netherlands and in Belgium, there are a couple of examples, but it's, it's part of a couple of front runners, they, uh, they do it. Yes, thank you. I just don't agree with one uh, your point. It, it was about the existing building. I think even there is been quite useful. <laughs> Because we have one example, we did some standards in 2013 for one Czech bank, and Aleš, his company, did the design after that. And uh, this uh, bank, they wanted to try uh, the standards, if it's correct, on the existing building. And the return of investment for them was uh, one year to invest to the, let's say, B model for the old building because they discovered that uh, they pay last eight years uh, repairing for for so many air condition units which they don't have because they paid according to, to some Excel sheet which was from construction. Yeah. yeah, but to achieve that goal, I don't need BIM. So my thing was, if I ask today to 10 facility managers, if they see the added value of BIM in managing their facilities, nine will say, I don't see the added value. I'm not saying in the future there will not be an added I believe that there is an added value. But if you ask them today now, I don't think you have a lot of positive answers. And that's the way to go. So there's a conference like this, Connecting to facility management can help and increase the awareness of BIM into facility management. And another question. I think, Alice, you didn't answer that question which was there from Stefano. About what uh, does yeah. it mean, this SP1 plus? Sorry for not explaining it. It was the, according to the uh, Czech standards of uh, work for architects, and the same is for engineers. It is SP means a service phase. Number one is a project analysis. Second one is architecture study or design. Third one is planning permit documentation. Fourth one is the building permit documents. Fifth one is execution drawing. Uh, second one is the uh, bill, bill of quantities plus specification. And so on, there's Astra supervision. And I put it together, the uh, execution drawing plus the bill of quantities, because it's mostly going together. And I think the beginning and the rest is not so much important, maybe the other supervision, but what is important, if we are starting to do a BIM, and when I listen to Jos and Petra uh, prior uh, responding this question, I think the first uh, maybe step will be to, to clarify between them what everyone means is a BIM. Yes, because by my experience, the FM model for BIM, it is a very simple graphics, but very full of FM data, so-called. Yeah? And it is oppositely for another user. So, so it is going with the usage, yes? And the question is, we will not talk about the BIM, which kind of data, graphic and non-graphic, we need for efficient and good uh, facility management or operation of the building. 
And I think we use, and back to what said, mostly we are starting to do the real. It is, and I mean real BIM, yes, it is necessary to explain. It is the, of course, 3D model. It is just another layer of information. But it means that all submodels, if you remember, our uh, scheme of a digital information model and information model is uh, all with all submodels from the trays, from the consultants plus supplement information uh, not in model and it is prior the building permit documentation and i think the fruits will come during the execution model so the increasing the uh, time allowance is bigger just for three percent than the seven eight percent in building permit and i think the key everyone is talking about the efficiency time saving and cost saving but I think, and my understanding is, we are using the computers, we are using the BIM, not to make the projects faster, because in the final we will get the same money for that. It is, well, it is as well the same with the computers by with CAD. But I think the main goal is to go to do the better buildings. Yes, that's the key. Yes, the quality is the key, not to be faster and faster and faster. What is it for? Leo, you wanted to mention well, something. Just, just on the first one listed, on the if it's additional skill or not primary profession, I would just not say additional skill. I would say that it would be the elementary skill. It would be mandatory skill, not just for designers and architects, but for anyone working in the construction industry, including accountants, including preparing the budgets, including the management, because that's the only way. But it won't be BIM. It will be information management principles. It will be the way how you record, how you store information, how you share it, and how you take care of what you record, what you did. It's the cultural change because like 30 years ago, people, people were hiring designers and what was the advantage? Knowing CAD, it was like plus, it was like benefit, right? You could get more money if you knew CAD. Now it's, it's BIM, right? You are hiring designer or architect, and what's the advantage of, for that uh, person? Knowing BIM, right? But BIM would be mandatory for everyone. It would be just part of the, uh, the curriculum for everyone, but it won't be understanding the chart we saw from CENTS442, right? With uh, 35 international standards. No one knows what they are for. It's for a group of scientists, implementers, high-tech software professionals to understand this, but we cannot expect the mass majority of the workers, employees in construction to even know there is a chart with uh, standards, right? If we want to show this to any normal person, they will just go away from any BIM because this is crazy, right? We need to go back. And as I said, it would be elementary skill. The tools would have to be different, not in the way that you need two weeks training to work with them. It's like working today with the Explorer. I don't mean Internet Explorer, like Windows Explorer, finding files, editing files. Like anyone can edit files with Word or Excel. It should be on the level of basic tools, and this would be mandatory for everyone, even using the mobile device, even using you know, some kind of simple interface, but having that culture of recording data. Right? People don't do it. People don't even put it on paper. They, just, they have to have this you know, strong culture, and this should be the, the education, how to work with uh, information management. Thank you. Please, Brigitte. Well, I, I agree 100%. I would even go a step further. Um, we had in the last uh, foundation certification program of Building Smart um, secretary from a department, and she, she was just sitting there, why am I here? And at the end of the day, she, she said, I'm so glad I was here. Now I can support you. I understand much more, and I can support, and even maybe people from the HR because at the end of the day, that we have the right people, because they understand what they have to look at. And uh, one of the compliments we got was, um, I'm not left behind anymore. I understand the basics. And there is where the, the, the inspiration comes from and where the innovation comes from. If everybody can say, I understand the basics, that's fantastic. 
Yeah, but I, like Brigitta said, I have to say because we are one of the, our consulting firm is one of the provider of training. And first people who were trained were all of the architects, all of the engineers, all of the modelers which we have in the company. All of them were trained and it's true that there was also the office manager. <laughs> it's them. Because he has to take care about the contract, so he has to know about it. Please, because we run out of the time, so I would uh, like to ask you for the last statement, and I will ask uh, Philip to start, because then Leos has a the beautiful right to end uh, this con conference. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Again, thanks very much for inviting me to be here. It's been a pleasure. But my message to everybody is, if we're going to make this work, we have to simplify the message to everyone. And this last interchange demonstrates that. You've got to, uh, there's a line from a movie, ask me the question as if I'm a six-year-old. I can't remember what the movie was. But if we simplify and get everybody using it, nobody will be afraid. A lot of people, if somebody walked into the door uh, earlier on today and listened to it, they wouldn't have had a clue what this, what, what this meeting was about. They really wouldn't have. They wouldn't have known that they were talking about construction at all. So let's simplify the message to let, and let everybody hear the story of how good digitalization will be for our industry moving forward. Well, I'd just uh, like to add something to that. It's exactly right. Uh, I think we have to use simple words and also pictures to visualize what we are talking about because uh, we need to help people to understand what we are talking about in this room and everywhere. And we ch can just use simple pictures. I especially like the presentation with the pictures, which will stay in my mind. Maybe the labyrinth will stay in your mind and the bridge over the labyrinth. So this is what we should do. Use very simple pictures, words to explain what is the value. And then we can move forward across the industry through everything. Josh, please. So my, my takeaway is that, uh, that actually we, we're starting in the collaboration process so that we, uh, across industries, across different groups of people who are connected to the, to the built environment, that we need to work together. And actually that, that this digitization can be part of the process as I don't know who was saying, to, to create better buildings. It's about the quality and really to much more connect to what people expect from the building, um, what they expect, that also this is reflected in how, how, the how the building is designed and built and maintained. So for me, that's the takeaway. Alish? Uh, for my point of view, it is just about to say thank you. Firstly, I have to uh, say thank you to Ministry of the, the Industry for organizing such good and professional event. Second, uh, thanks is going to you, you visitors, that you came and listened to us. And the third thanks is going to my colleagues uh, to give us uh, all of us a time, yes, and to share with us their visions and opinions. And I think without such uh, events like this one, we won't move further. So I think it is not the last, but another step on the good future with BIM. Thanks for coming. So thank you. And uh, truly, this uh, last question, it reminds me one of the uh, Czech uh, theater director, Aleš Borna, who already died. And he did excellent theater plays for all families where parents were laughing and enjoying the uh, play, kids as well. And once they ask him how he, how he do it, how he does it, that uh, it's how uh, that it's so perfect for everyone and he says the topic is the same for adults for the kids it's just different language and how to tell the story and this is i think what we have to do with bim as well and please Leosh, if you can close this excellent okay the closing conference. session yeah uh, everyone, we are so glad you came and i need to say it's been almost three days right we started with the dinner on Tuesday afternoon, and it's uh, Thursday afternoon, so if you uh, in, were involved in most of the parts, 
And I don't know what was happening after I left yesterday, so maybe it was even longer, but we had three full days of, uh, I wouldn't say team building, but really international interaction, cooperation and exchange. And we need to thank, on behalf of the organizers, on behalf of the Ministry of Industry and Trade and the expert partners of the conference, on behalf of Building Smart Czech Republic and the Czech Agency for Standardization, we need to thank everyone for coming to Prague, being part of this and being active in the discussions or active in the exchange of, of uh, the questions, answers and the discussion overall. And we need to thank the organizers, Ms. Uh, Ms. Eva Winterova, who was the official head of the organization. We need to thank the uh, ladies from the Building Smart Czech Republic, Lucie uh, Kamenčkova and her colleague. And uh, I would make a special thanks here <clears throat> because Maybe six, seven years ago, we weren't, we couldn't imagine there would be a government-sponsored uh, BIM or the con construction digitization event in Prague as a part of the uh, Czech presidency of the European Union. And there's one person who changed that, and we need to thank to him all of. Maybe most of you don't know him, but he's the director of the uh, in the, uh, of the department of the build uh, construction at the Ministry of Industry and Trade. Is Mr. Peter Serafin, and I will ask him to stand up. <laughs> Because, because P Peter really changed the mind of the government and administration to allow even to think about BIM in the Czech government. And Peter will be retiring just in a few weeks, so we really thank him. And on this level of the European event, we thank Peter for all the support he gave to digitization of construction and BIM in our country. And not only in country, because he helped to organize this uh, this event for whole Europe and we thank him and thank to all of you. So we hope to see you maybe not at the Czech EU organized presidency event because it will be in 13 years and um, probably some of us <laughs> will be retired and we'll be just looking forward to have different worries then. then but, but still at some other events we will always be glad to host you in Prague. We will look at preparing some special events on BIM and all, all the topics you had today, and uh, all of us will be welcome. So thanks again, and have a safe trip home, and Merry Christmas for all those who, who celebrate Christmas. I need to say that, right? <laughs> and enjoy the uh, the festivities at the end of the year. That's the right, yeah? What you're saying in Brussels, right? Okay, enjoy, and have a safe trip home. Bye-bye.